Okay, let's all stand. Uh, we're going to start as the countdown finishes. Those online don't know what's going on in here. Great to see you. Thanks for joining us today, both in uh, house and online. Mm, my life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord. In you, it's in you. My life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord. In you, it's in you. I will praise you with all of my life. I will praise you with all of my strength. With all of my life. With all of my strength. All of my hope is in you. My life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord, in you, it's in you, my life is in you, Lord, my strength is in you, Lord, my hope is in you, Lord, in you, it's in you, in you, it's in you, in you, it's in you, it's in you. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever. Our hope, our strong together. Father, thank you for this day. We thank you for our time together as a family, both here and also joining online. Uh, we're just blessed to be together in whatever way we can. Uh, through our songs, through our words, through our prayers, through our time of communion, through the lesson, may all of it be a way for us to experience your presence. And uh, we thank you for this opportunity uh, to do that. In Christ's name, amen. Let's all uh, read this part together. May, may the, the God, God who gives, gives patience and encouragement give you the same attitude as Christ Jesus, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust him and by the power of the Holy Spirit may you overflow with hope. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the dark
I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. You can be seated. We'll now have our time of communion. He says, the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. You know, I'm sure we've all seen these paintings of the Last Supper, and, um, and, and I've always wondered, what would it be like if we could go back in time and be a fly on the wall in that room? Imagine Jesus there with his apostles and him telling them that one of them was going to betray him. You know, just to see the looks on their faces, some of them angry, some of them in disbelief. And as we all know, soon afterwards, he was crucified. Well, 2,000 years later, we still celebrate the Last Supper throughout the world, Christians everywhere through the Holy Communion. And that makes me think about, you know, my history with communion and um, when I was a boy growing up. I went to a school in South Florida called Belen Jesuit Preparatory School. It was a Catholic school run by Jesuit priests and it was all boys. That's me in 10th grade, by the way sometime around 1979, I think. Every morning from when I was in seventh grade to when I was a senior in high school, um, we would have a mass. And during mass, there was a point where we'd all line up and they'd have everything ready. They had a communion table and all their supplies. And we'd get in this line and the priests would give each one of us a piece of bread. And then they would let us drink out of this shiny goblet you know, and every time we drink, he'd wipe it clean. And um, I have so many memories of that growing up as a kid. And now, today, we have this. Who invented this? I mean, the first time I saw one of these was at a SunQuest about eight years ago. And I think some of you know what I'm talking about. This. I think they're known as communion lunchables because everything is contained in one little package for you. Um, assuming you can get it open, there's a juice in here, which is grape juice, and sometimes it has kind of a, a mystery flavor. And then uh, the wafer that's on top, assuming you can get this open, I'm still trying to figure out what this thing is made out of. I mean, is it cardboard? Is it styrofoam? Who knows? We still have to figure that out. But in any case, it's good to know that no matter how you're taking communion today, whether it's wine or grape juice, 
whether it's bread or a mystery wafer, we're all doing it for the right reason. We're doing it because we're trying to remember that Jesus died on the cross for our sins so that we could live in eternity forever. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving us hope. Thank you for letting us know that no matter what's going on in the world, no matter how crazy things are, we know that you're protecting us and we know that through you all things are possible. As we take this bread that represents your body that was broken for us and we drink from this cup that represents the blood that was shed for us, we know that you gave up your life so that we could have eternal life. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I have a maker He formed my heart Before even time began My life was in His hands He knows my name Good morning. Man, it's just great to be here. It's such a beautiful day. Uh, I try to check the weather here this summer, Central Florida. Man, there's like rain all the time. And so not just, uh, or at least there's a forecast of rain all the time. And it'll be a torrential downpour, sometimes for like 10 minutes. And then it's back to sunny. And it was showing it being rainy all morning today. And uh, I can see we've got the door still open. It is just a beautiful morning outside. And so, uh, but good morning to each of you who are joining us uh, virtually, as well as everyone here uh, in our auditorium, uh, are singing these last many weeks since we uh, had our re-entry on campus has just been beautiful. Thank you so much, Tim and Ashley and all the praise team for your part in that and just uh, being able to uh, lift up uh, our voices and praise to God together has been so uplifting to me and I think to, uh, to everybody. Uh, great communion meditation there, Carlos. Appreciated that uh, very much. 
and uh, just our prayers, our scripture readings, everything uh, is just so meaningful and purposeful, and uh, and I think is is uh, doing what God designed for it to do, and, and us as a community of believers being together. I want to highlight our birthdays. There were no anniversaries that I'm aware of in our uh, West Orange family this past uh, week. But on uh, Monday, Gordon Jirasi, he turned 86. So wish you, Gordon and Sherry. Hope you're doing well. Uh, and then on Wednesday, uh, Garrett Duncan and uh, Miss Pat, Pat Irvine, they both had uh, birthdays. On Saturday, Miss Carol uh, had a birthday. And a happy birthday to you. And then today is, it says Robert Armistead, but that's Bob. So uh, Bob and Ann, they've been connecting online. So wish you a happy birthday today, Bob, as well as Lucas Bell. Uh, happy birthday uh, to you, uh, Lucas. And uh, we're still on Baby Watson Watch. Um, so I've uh, been connecting with Billy each and every day, including last night, again this morning. Uh, Lindsay is undoubtedly tired at this point. Uh, so they're home this morning connecting online. Uh, but I believe uh, this little fella, uh, that it, he was, uh, his uh, initial due date was uh, July the 3rd. So nine days ago was the initial due date. And then they're like, well, we're going to do it like, you know, if nothing happens, the 5th or the 6th. And then they looked at uh, this past Thursday was going to be the day. And uh, anyway, she is like next in line on the waiting list with all the protocols and different things. But I share all that to say, uh, this guy's already showing his personality, isn't he? Uh, it's going to be a fun, he's having fun making us wait for his entry uh, into the world, building the suspense. So, uh, so anyway, but any moment now, uh, we'll be getting that good news and, and uh, being able to celebrate uh, with them and for them uh, in that. And uh, so, uh, even though there's been all this disruption, if you will, of the past many months, and uh, th that, uh, you know, life keeps going on, right? There's still births. There's still uh, birthdays. There's still baptisms. You know, we've had a few baptisms here uh, in the last few months. Things continue to go. Yes, it's scaled. It's a hybrid. Uh, things are different. And so I want to share one more. Every week, of course, we've got visitors joining online. And, you know, we, we, we can't tell a lot about the number. We can see, okay, if 200 watched on a Sunday, okay, 40 were live and others later. And, and uh, you know, you don't know how many of those are individuals or different ones. But every week since we have had our re-entry we've had visitors uh, off and on on our campus but uh, one person I'm going to recognize now uh, started coming uh, some last year in 2019 and then has been back with us and she has made the decision uh, that she wants to join our church family and participate and so we'll be getting her picture and all that but I'm going to ask Miss Shireen if you would to stand she knew this was coming but uh, Miss Shireen Hales let's welcome her into our spiritual family She's a very spiritual lady and just loves praising God and just has a beautiful smile as you can see and, and, uh, and so it's infectious. Your smile is infectious and, and her, her spirit and, and joy for the Lord. So uh, we're excited about, uh, about getting to know you better and about you using your spiritual gifts here. Uh, in our family. If you have a Bible, you can open it to James chapter 4. Uh, our main text uh, this morning will be verses 1 through 7, and then next week, Lord willing, verses 8 through uh, 12. Uh, but uh, we're going to have a mini series these last three weeks uh, in July on social distancing. And you may be thinking, what do you mean? We, we've been, you know, that, that's a thing, it's still present, but that's something we've already known enough about. Social distancing from Satan. We're going to talk the next three weeks about social distancing from Satan. And, and I think we can all agree that's a relevant one for us to talk about. Uh, our key verses are going to be James 4, verses 7 and 8 for the whole series. Let me read those for us now. James 4, 7 and 8. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and He will come near to you. Wash your hands. There's been an emphasis on that, right? Wash your hands, you sinners. Been a lot more hand washing the last four months. But He's talking spiritually. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. What if, what if we put as much effort into resisting temptation as we do and have been doing into social distancing. Constantly it's been in front of us and, and we strive for that, you know, to, to, to keep one another healthy. 
How cautious and vigilant should we be about washing our hands clean from sinful choices and habits. Now to get us thinking this morning, we got a short clip we're going to show of Angie and also with uh, Myla. Uh, this concept you know, of Satan back in the beginning in Genesis 3 and what we think about Satan. So uh, let's watch this uh, video clip. If I asked what picture comes into your mind when I say the name Satan, what would you tell me? What would it be? If you said red skin and horns and a pointy tail and a pitchfork, then you're probably thinking about something that you've seen on TV or maybe in a movie, because that's a picture that we get shown quite a bit. But in 1 Peter, it tells us that the devil is like a roaring lion. And in 2 Corinthians, it says that he masquerades or dresses up like an angel of light as something that's good. Hmm. So maybe that's not the best picture to have in our mind when we think of Satan. You know, I often also think of Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, Eve comes across a snake. Now, if I came across the snake, I can guarantee you it would look something like this. <laughs> Maybe even a little faster than that, right? <laughs> but the picture that we have of what happened with Eve when she came across the snake is a little bit different. It would have looked something like this. So why was Eve's reaction to that snake different than what mine would be? Well, you've got to remember Eve and Adam lived in this garden that was full of animals. There were big animals and small animals. You know, even if a roaring lion had come up to Eve, I don't think she would have been afraid. I think she would have just realized that this was another animal in the garden. And so Eve was not afraid at all of that snake. And so the snake asked her a question. And it wasn't, hey, I've got this, this tree right here. Look at this juicy piece of fruit. Would you like a bite? That's not what the snake asked. The snake asked Eve about what God had said. And his question was, did God really say that you can't eat from any tree in the garden? We will see the uh, part two of that uh, next week and the concept of, uh, of uh, Satan there and, and what continues uh, to happen there. Uh, I want us to take us back now to uh, verses one and two of, uh, of our text here. James chapter four, uh, picking up in verse one, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. I want you to imagine that your residence, your, your home or your apartment or wherever your location is, I want you to imagine that where you live was in a war zone. I want you to imagine that uh, that, that where you lived, where you were located, that there were armed soldiers, not just from our country, but from some invading country, and that they were fighting with each other, and that within your home, you could hear the gunfire, you could hear the explosions, and if you were to look out of a window, that you would see the, 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 the wreckage and you would see the, the, the smoke and, and that you would, you would be able to observe uh, what was happening. You could also choose to wear ear protectors. Maybe some of y'all did that the 4th of July. You know, people are, neighbors are shooting things off really late and, and uh, several days, not just that one night and, and, and celebrating, but it's loud. And, and so you wear the ear protectors where maybe you won't hear it. And, you know, I'm not going to go outside and look or open a window and look. Uh, we could do things. We could close the curtains, close the blinds, and we could just ignore the war and we could pretend like it's not happening. 
And certainly there have been physical wars on our soul through the decades and centuries back. And people have had to experience those things. But I share all that to say that James, just like Paul and Peter in their letters, that he conveys that we find ourselves in a spiritual war. And it's the most uh, real and consequential of all wars. And uh, we might pretend like it's not there. We might pretend like we're not engaged in some kind of battle with Satan and that you know there's no need to, to social distance from him. But the war is real. Uh, James gives us some insights and some challenges here. And in verses 1-3, through three, he begins with the reasons for strife. Hear me here. Reasons for strife in the Christian community. In other words, James starts to pinpoint, and he's just talked about words in our tongue in chapter 3, and, and, he, and he, he's talked about you know uh, inequalities and injustice in chapter 2 between rich and poor, and, and now he gets to chapter 4, and he, and he hones in a little closer here, and, and he's going to show us that there's not just some war out there, but that also it is inward within the body of Believers, and he asked this question What causes fights and quarrels among you? Not talking about fighting out in the world, yes, it's there, but what about within the body of Christ? James accurately describes strife among Christians with the terms wars and fights, and, and often the battles among Christians are bitter and severe. And he asked the question then, Don't they come? from your desires that battle within you. And so the, the source of wars and fights among Christians is always the same. Yes, Satan can use different external circumstances, but ultimately, it's, the, it's rooted in the flesh. In our selfish nature, there is this internal war within the believer regarding the lust of the flesh and within believers as a whole. James doesn't seem to be bothered more he seems to be bothered more by the selfish spirit and the bitterness of the quarrels than by the rights and the wrongs of the various viewpoints. Do you sense the difference there? That more than what the fighting ends up ultimately being about, if you will, is more of that it's coming from selfishness and bitterness. He says, your desires for pleasure that war in your members. And so he describes the type of uh, desires that lead to, to conflict. And he talks about covetousness and how it leads to conflict. You lust for what you do not have. And then anger and animosity and how they lead to hatred and conflict. And he even uses the word kill there, right? The word murder. Uh, James looks back to the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus also used murder to express more than actual killing, though it includes that, but also an inward condition of our heart shown outwardly through anger. Matthew 5, 21 and 22. The word kill here, or some translations murder, it's startling. And I believe G uh, James, that's the inspired word he intended to use. He meant to startle the body of Christ. He sought to force his listeners and his readers to realize the depth of the evil that was in their bitter hearts of hatred towards each other. In verse 2, he says, you desire but do not have. He points to, to the futility of this life lived for the desires of pleasure. Not only is it a life of conflict, but he now describes this life that is fundamentally an unsatisfied life. And he's saying here, how can you as believers who believe in Almighty God, you know, how can you still be subscribing to this world system and pleasures and quarrels and, and self-centeredness? He's saying to so many of them and to us, you've missed it. This is the tragic irony of the life lived after worldly and fleshly desires. It never reaches the goal of anything that it goes for. And this fundamental dissatisfaction is not because of a lack of effort. No, they're, they're striving for it in James 4. They're trying. He's like, you know, you're looking for it and you're going after it and you're fighting each other. And boy, the devil's all in that. He says... You do not have because you do not ask when you get to verse 3. 
The reason these destructive desires exist among Christians is when and because they and we do not seek God for their and for our needs. He says, you do not. Ask, and that's where we're ultimately going to land in this series. Yeah, talking about distancing from Satan and, and getting away from him, but ultimately about submitting to God and pursuing God, obeying God, getting closer to him. But, but James reminds us here of the great power of prayer and purpose of prayer. So picking up uh, verses uh, 4 and 5. Boy, it stings some more here. He says, you adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the Spirit he has caused to dwell in us? So he is rebuking believers. It's a rebuke of compromise and it's a rebuke of covetousness. He says, you adulterous people. He says, you, you're, you, I would describe you as having a friendship with the world. You are flirting with the world. You say you're married to God, but you're still entertaining this relationship with the world. You have compromised. And this rebuke is presented frequently in the Old Testament Scriptures, especially prophets like, uh, like uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Hosea who use that same language of, of adultery and, and of idolatry and, uh, and of being married to idols and to the world instead of being faithful to our faithful God and having a friendship with God. James saw their covetousness and their compromise as being idolatry and friendship with the world. And he recognizes that we cannot have both. They cannot coexist. That, that we cannot be both friends with the world system in rebellion against God and at the same time say we're friends in harmony with God, on mission with God. Jesus talks about that in Matthew 6.24. Can't serve two masters. Can't serve God and mammon, God and money. Two different systems. You can't do it. The strong statements James makes here remind us that all was not beautiful in the early church. They had plenty of uh, selfishness, carnality, you know, lust, uh, worldliness to deal with. Yes, the New Testament gives us a clear pattern for the church and the good things and the directives from God. Not dismissing that at all. But we should not over-romanticize the spiritual character of of the early church. The struggles we have, they had. Now he talks about the danger of pride. And I set all that up because I wanted you to see the context of it. It often comes out with us with each other. But this is, so if we just started in verse 6, we would have missed all that. But then he says this, verse 6. But he gives us more grace. Boy, we need a lot of grace right now. Leaders need grace. We all need grace. That is why Scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. I believe the, most, the, the hardest advice of all that some of us are ever going to hear of all the things in Scripture and all the things that a spiritual mentor, a, a parent, a grant, that anybody could say to us, for those of us who struggle with pride, with stubbornness, with self-reliance, here it is. And, and, and we can say, I'm not going to read, I'm not going to look at it. You know, he talks in chapter 1, you know, sometimes we're like looking in the mirror and then we just forget what God's Word. You know, we don't want to hear it, we don't want to see it. He says here, to the person who is relying on himself or herself, the hardest thing is going to be submission. With all the wars and all the fightings, trying to fight based on your ability, your energy, your knowledge, your resources, all of that, he tells us, it's our pride. And so he gets to verse 7 and 8 that I've already read, our theme verses. And he says, Submit yourselves then to God, Resist the devil. Social distance from the devil. Be aware of the devil. Whether you can see him or not see him. That he's around. That he's lurking. Maybe it's in different forms. Like in Genesis 3 it was a serpent. That Angie and Mila shared. 
We're going to say a little bit about submission now and then most of it next week. But the language that's taken here is from that of warfare again. The word submit as a good soldier would put themselves in complete subjection to their leader, their captain, their superior. That, that we are to submit to Jesus Christ. That He is the one to reign and He's the one that we're going to listen to whether it makes sense or doesn't make sense. I'll say this, for all the years that I've been a follower of Jesus and the more I read Scripture and you know, I grew up hearing and learning you know, things here and there, but I tell you what, things make a lot more sense the longer you stay in God's Word. And the, when you read what He says and the more you grow and mature, then you, you know, things that used to not make sense, they start to make sense. I, we did two lessons, Angie and I, we did two lessons recently, the last one uh, in our previous series, and then we kind of did a bridge last week, uh, and we talked a lot about forgiveness. You know what? I was feeling pretty good about me, and, and, and you know, that, that I don't have any grudge, I don't have anything on it. Guess what? Then this last week, something came up, and I had to decide. Am I going to hold on to this and grudge? And, or, or am I going to do what God was speaking to me about the last two weeks? And let me tell you something. It makes a lot more sense. A lot healthier. A lot better to do it God's way than our way. It's this warfare and to submit and to resist. To stand bravely against. We don't back down from the devil. We resist him but not on our not on our sources, but we are submitting to God. And it says, watch this, He will flee. He'll actually social distance from us. How about that? It says, He will flee. Or, or one translation, He shall flee. In other words, this is a promise of God. We talk about all the thousands of promises. In Scripture. Here's a promise. The devil will flee from you. Well, if you're submitted to God. Right, It's not really about you. He sees God, right? He will flee. He will distance Himself from you. Why? Not because He sees you all of a sudden. He's been seeing you, but now He sees God in the picture. And He sees your posture with God. You're submitted to God. You're yielded and surrendered to God. He sees now our relationship with God. And now I'm saying, I'm not going to be prideful. I want the grace, and I'm going to be surrendered to God. Now, God, I'm going to rely upon You. I'm going to obey You. I'm going to trust You. In this war. Angie has a great video. My favorite of all of them is next week. They're all been good. Whether it's up here in videos. Next week. She's already made the one for next week. Because we planned ahead. And it is so. But this one is good too. And after this. We're going to if you will. Land the plane Rich. You know. We're, I got one final story and challenge. But she is going to share uh, for our kids' connection, but it's for us big kids too, maybe even more, these oranges and about being submerged in water and this illustration of us really submitting to God and going deeper in our relationship with God and things that might hold us back. So let's watch that. I've got a simple experiment for us today, and we've got three identical pitchers of water. I also have three identical oranges for us to use. Uh, okay, maybe they're not quite identical, but I got them all out of the exact same bag and I drew the same kind of happy face on them. That's as close to identical as you can get when it's oranges. We're going to be looking at the depth of this water. That means how deep it is. And we're going to use that to represent our relationship with God. Now, do we want to have a relationship with God that stays up here near the surface? Or do we want to have a deep, deep, deep relationship with God? That's right. We want it to be as deep as can be, right? Deeper and deeper every day. That's our goal. Well, this first orange is going to represent a person who decides that he wants to have a relationship with God. And he decides he's going to be baptized. But he decides that, you know what, all of that old stuff that is, is around him... The, the sins that he has, he's going to hang on to all of those things. He doesn't want to ha let God have any of those. So after he has been baptized, he doesn't let go of any of that. He hangs on to it. Do you think this person is going to have a deep relationship with God or up near the surface? 
All right, let's find out what happens. I'm gonna put this orange in our water. Yep, right up there at the top, you were right. You can't have a deep relationship with God when he's got all of that old sin on, right? Okay, so our next orange makes that same decision, wants to have a walk with God, right? And so she says, okay, you know what? I know I've got to get rid of some of this sin that I've got. It's, it's not good stuff. I've got to get rid of it. So God can have the trouble I've had with lying, and maybe I've had trouble taking stuff that's not mine. Maybe I've had a bad attitude with mom and dad and have been disrespectful. God can have those things. So when you look at this orange, it looks pretty good, right? But what else do you see? Ooh, there's still a lot of stuff that this orange is not willing to give to God. Do you think this orange is going to have a deep relationship with God? Do you think this orange is gonna stay up at the top? Do you think it's gonna be somewhere in the middle? She did get rid of a lot of the stuff. Let's see what happens. Wow, even though this orange has a lot of stuff that she got rid of, she's still barely scratching the surface of that walk with God, that deep walk of God that she would want. So we've got one more orange and this orange has decided that they want that walk with God. And he says, you know what? I have had some trouble with forgiving the people around me. I've been rude to mom and dad. I have had trouble getting along with my brother and my sister. I have had a lot of times where I've gotten angry and said and done things that I know would not be pleasing to God. God, please take all of that. And that orange wants God to take it all away. And so that's what God does. What do you think is going to happen when I put this orange in the water? Do you think it's going to stay at the surface like the others? Do you think it's going to be about halfway down? Do you think it's going to go all the way at the bottom? What do you think is going to happen? All right, let's see if you're right. all the way at the bottom. So if we allow God to get rid of that sin and we don't try to hang on to any of it, if we don't say, oh, it doesn't matter, nobody will know and God won't care, that's just a little thing. If we get rid of those things that are keeping us back from God, then we'll be able to have that close walk with him just like this third orange. Bye guys. Which orange am I? James is mostly writing to those of us who are in that middle picture. You know, we're believers in Christ and we started to make some commitment to Christ. And, and you know, we let God start to work in our hearts and on our life. And, and we're social distancing from Satan and, and get things. But, but then we, we just compromise. And we, we stay at the surface. We don't go deeper. We don't draw near to God as fully as we could so that as the promise goes on to say that we'll look more at next week, He will draw near to you. We can be as close to God as we want to be, as we choose to be, and He wants to be near to us. Long ago, a young man struggled with this very issue of sin and surrender. In his youth, his sexual escapades were well known. According to his own testimony, he was trapped, as he put it, in the swirling mist of lust that thrust him into the, quote, whirlpools of vice. He went to church. He maintained a facade of religious respectability. But as he later reflected on his behavior, he considered his life to be an intolerable moral contradiction. This man's name, today we know him as Saint Augustine. But a saint he was not in the early years of his life. Eventually Augustine was drawn to a famous preacher who was the Bishop of Milan. And listening to Ambrose, Augustine began to see himself as he really was. And eventually 
He was truly converted and, and submitted and his life was changed completely. Augustine didn't believe that you could embrace Christ as your Savior apart from bowing your knee in submission and recognition to His Lordship. Writing of Augustine's concept of discipleship, Richard Foster says this, Augustine did not believe, as is so common today, that one could be a convert to Christ without being a disciple of Christ. For him, conversion and discipleship were two sides of the same door. Both were necessary for one to pass through the doorway. He knew that receiving Christ required a radical reordering of his life. He had counted the cost and understood that conversion meant a lifestyle without his mistress. Even more, he knew that turning to Christ meant turning from the arrogance and intellectual pride that had driven him so fiercely. For Augustine, conversion was not ascending easily to a few propositions. It was restructuring his whole life. What does it mean to be a Christian today? Does it mean that you just join a church? Does it mean you just sign a card? Does it just mean you just, you know, if the preacher asks some question, you raise your hand or you recite something? Let's ponder these statements from James again. James 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's what it means for us. Think about this one, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And one more, reflect on Jesus' stern words to his disciples. I referenced it earlier, Matthew 6.24. No one can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. At some point, if our commitment is genuine, it must go so deep that our behavior and our lifestyle are affected. We talk about culture, you know, church culture. Talk about culture and businesses, organizations. Culture in so many ways is what we believe, but ultimately culture is behavior. It's behavior. Whatever you're doing, that's your culture. If it's good, that's great. Positive culture being reinforced. There's probably beliefs driving that behavior, those habits, those routines. But the same if it's not. At some point, if our commitment is genuine, we must go so deep that our lifestyle and our behavior are changed. Life is too short to play games. Augustine knew for so long in his religion, he was playing games. And he had people tricked. But he didn't have the devil tricked and he didn't have God tricked. And he was in that self-deception for so long. Life's too short to go through the motions of pretending to be what we are not. So my plea this morning, whether online or here in person, for everyone who's studying this together, is let's not let this be just another Sunday. That any area of our life that we need to surrender to God and resist the devil, that we do that very thing. It could be in your prayer closet today. It could be finding someone after our gathering. It could be connecting with someone this week. We're a family. We're all here. Our shepherds, they're accessible. The ministry team, we're accessible. But we all need each other, don't we? And if there's anything that we need to surrender, let's do that. If you see in Augustine struggle something of your life, you too can surrender to God. Take the plunge. Be that orange that goes deeper in the waters of God's love. God's love is always there when we're at our weakest point, when we feel stuck, when we feel ashamed, when it looks like we're losing the war. We're going to sing a song now. Listen to our hearts. We're going to pour this out to God. Listen to our hearts. It's a time for reflection. It's a time for worship. But it's a time for commitment and action in surrendering and being obedient to God and what He wants for us.
Let's worship. How do you explain, how do you describe a love that goes from east to west and runs as deep as it is wide? You know all our hopes, Lord, you know all our fears, and words cannot express the love we feel. But we long for you to hear. So listen to our heart. Please hear our spirit sing. And hear us sing. A song of praise. A simple song of praise. From those you have redeemed. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are. But words are not enough to tell you of our love. So listen to our hearts. If words could fall like rain from these lips of mine. And if I had a thousand years, Lord, I would still run out of time. If you listen to my heart, every beat will say, thank you for the life, thank you for the truth, and thank you for the way. So listen to our heart. Please listen. Hear our spirit sing. A song of praise that flows from those you have redeemed. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are. But words are not enough to tell you of our love, so listen to our heart. Thanks again for joining us today. We hope you have a great week. Take care. Change